the National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. From the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, death by adoption. It is 9.45 p.m. on a Saturday night, September 1937. The business district of Central City, Texas, is dark, except for the office of Harry Cashman's used car lot. Cashman is pacing the small office in agitation. A man in a leather windbreaker crosses the lot, slipping between the cars for sale, and knocks at the door. Well, how do you, Mr. Cashman? Uh. Glad to see you waited for me. All right, spit it out. What do you want this time? I'm kind of short on folding money. Thought you might be a pal and help me out again. You know what this is, don't you, Stryker? The Lord called it a shakedown. I gave you $100 two weeks ago and another 100 the month before. So I need more. Well, you're not getting more, not from me. Why, well, it's too bad. I'm sorry you feel that way, Mr. Cashman. I kind of thought you were a nice guy. Oh. The kind of guy I'd like to see raise my baby long as I can't raise her myself. Now, you leave the baby out of this. Now, you can't expect me to forget about her, Mr. Cashman. After all, she's my own flesh and blood. She belongs to me and my wife, legally, by adoption. Yeah, but you keep forgetting one important thing. I never signed no papers letting you adopt her. Your wife said you were dead. She thought I was dead. But my being here proves I ain't. And if we ever have to take this into court, Mr. Cashman, I'm baby Ann's natural father. I got my rights, you know. All right, how much? Reckon a hundred will see me through again. I'll give you five hundred. Why, it's better. Now, just a minute. I'll give you five hundred if you sign a paper waiving all rights to baby Ann. I ain't signing nothing. I like our arrangement just the way it is. It's working out fine. If you think... Well, go ahead, Mr. Cashman. Answer. It may be business, and I'd like to see you do a good business. For the baby's sake, you understand? <sighs> Hello. Harry, why aren't you home? It's almost 10 o'clock. Oh, I, I'll be home in a little while, Hazel. Uh, something came up. You sound worried. Is anything wrong? No, 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 no. Of course not. The baby wanted to wait up for you. I let her stay up till 8.30, but by then she just kept rubbing her eyes and her nose and saying, where's my daddy, till she couldn't hold her little head up. Well, I, I'm sorry, Hazel. Uh, give her a kiss for me. I, I'll be home in a little while. Harry, are you sure there's nothing sound like you're upset about something. Oh, it's, it's nothing. I'm just tired. I'll see you in half an hour. Well, all right, dear. Goodbye. Goodbye, honey. That your wife? Yes. Never did meet her. Maybe we ought to all get together, have a little talk. Huh? Stryker, if you try that, it's the last talk you'll ever have. What are you trying to do? Your baby's got a home, a good home, and we love her. We've been married 15 years, never had a child of our own. And now we've got her, and she's ours. Why, if we ever lost her, we'd have nothing to live for. Haven't you got a heart? Well, I can see I made a big mistake, Mr. Cashman. I should have started seeing you a lot sooner and a lot often. Now, what do you mean by that? That from now on, I'll be around every Saturday night to pick up my hundred dollars. And I'll take tonight's payment right now. Why, Don't you... be a fool, Mr. Cashman. I'm younger and a lot stronger than you. Now, don't get yourself hurt. Now, how about my money? All right, Stryker. There's your hundred. And it's the last you're getting. Now, get out of my sight and don't ever come back. Because if you do, I'll go to the police. I'll spend every dollar I've got fighting you. I'll prove what you are. I'll prove you're not fit to have custody of Anne. 
Mr. Cashman, I do believe you mean that. Eh? I swear before heaven I mean it. So this is your part and gift to me, eh? Not much considering the size of the role you peeled it off, huh? All right. All right, I'll leave you alone. I'll take my payment in full right now. Dig that roll out again. Toss on the desk. Oh, I see. Now it's a gun, huh? You see it, and I know how to use it. How could Anne have a father like you? She couldn't have, not you. You've never proved you are her father. <laughs> You're getting real bright tonight, Mr. Cashman. I get the money up on the desk. I'm not going to give you another dime, Striker. All I'm going to give you is what you deserve. Get away from that phone. I'm going to call the police. You ain't calling anybody. Oh, rock it. Maybe I'm stronger than you think. Yeah, but you ain't stronger than this. Oh. Now, give me that money. Oh, no. <laughs> Maybe you should have been fighting your way. You see, you're still the only one who knows about me, and you ain't never going to tell anyone else. Thanks for the final payment. At 11 o'clock, after three more calls to her husband's used car lot, Hazel Cashman was disturbed by the busy signal and her husband's failure to come home. A phone company check showed the line was not in use. Hazel Cashman called the police. They found Harry Cashman's body and requested aid from the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned. He arrived at the lot shortly after 2 a.m. I'm afraid that's all the information I can give you, man. Oh, uh, howdy, Ranger. You must be Jace Pearson. That's right. You in charge here? Yeah. The Dan Simmons, chief of police. Uh, fellas, I'll talk to you later. All right. I see you've already lifted some fingerprints. Huh? How'd you know? Oh, dusting powder on the glass top here. Uh, yeah, the crew just left. Ah, uh, prints aren't going to be much good, though, I'm afraid. Too many people coming in and out of a place like this, signing papers on that desk. What's that over there, chief? What? Oh, that yellow spot on the carpet? Yeah. I noticed that before. Seems to be a piece of chalk that was stepped on. A few little pieces not quite ground in. I don't see a blackboard or anything around here. Any of the for sale signs on the cars marked with chalk? No, no. They're all marked with cardboard cutouts. Well, the floor is pretty clean otherwise. Waste paper basket's empty. Yeah. This place was swept out after the day's business. That chalk got ground into the rug last night after the place was cleaned. Yeah, I can see that now. And the phone hanging off the hook like that when you got here? Uh huh. Cashman struggled with whoever killed him. He must have been trying to make a call. Oh, I don't know, Jace. Body is just where we found it. A good eight feet from the phone. Yeah, he might have staggered over there and fell, but the fight started right here by the desk and the phone. Uh, got some reason for being so sure then? The desk was moved a little in the fight, Chief. Look at the carpet. Deep worn spot where the desk usually rested. Carpet's bunched up around the base, showing the desk was pushed, not lifted, and moved for any reason. Uh, you're right. I can't see that it helps us any, though. Give us this little picture of the action, that's all. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get some of this yellow chalk in an envelope. Uh, you going to send that to your lab at Austin? That's right. They can analyze it. Maybe come up with something. That's worth a shot. Doesn't seem to be much anything else to help us, though. Robbery motive for murder is usually the toughest one to crack. Can Cashman make a habit of carrying a lot of money? Yeah, had to in this business. People selling cars in a hurry need a fast dollar. He usually had a couple of thousand on them. All we found in his pocket was 86 cents and change. Uh, you finished here? Yeah. I'd like you to put a man to work on that filing cabinet. Get a record of all sales. We've already checked that. Every car Cashman has accounted for. Nothing's been stolen from the lot. I wasn't thinking of a stolen car. I just want a list of recent customers. Oh. Somebody might have bought an automobile he wasn't happy with and come back to get even. Uh, could be, but I'm afraid that's a blind alley too, Ranger. Cashman gave a mighty good guarantee on everything he sold, and he stood behind it a hundred percent. Just the same, let's check it. I want to examine every reason he might have been killed a hundred percent. I sent the ground yellow chalk through to Austin. There was nothing that could be done that night, but the next morning, Chief Simmons and I went to see Hazel Cashman, the dead man's wife. <laughs> we don't like to ask you questions at a time like this, Mrs. Cashman, but... I... I understand, and I want to help you if I can. Probably isn't much you can tell us, but any little thing might help. Your husband ever have trouble with anybody? No. Aside from the money he carried, do you know of any reason why anybody might have been out to get him? No. 
there was never anybody who didn't like Harriet. What am I going to tell the baby? How am I ever going to make her understand that her daddy won't ever come home again? Would, would you answer that for me, please? I, I don't want to talk to anybody now. Why, sure, ma'am. Maybe for us, anyhow. Had to leave this number at headquarters. Hello? Yes, yeah, Simmons speaking. Go ahead, I'll write it down. We, we were going on a picnic today. Last night, I made the sandwiches and everything. We, we were going to leave right after church. I knew something was wrong when he didn't come home. I knew it. Take it easy, ma'am. All week long, Harriet was teaching Ann how to say picnic. She was just learning to pronounce it. No. You've got to get a grip, ma'am, for your baby's sake. Yes. Yes, I know. All right. Thanks. We'll be in soon. I better get back to headquarters, Chase. Uh, unless you have something else to ask Mrs. Cashman. No. You shouldn't be alone, though, ma'am. Especially when your baby wakes up. I called a neighbor just before you came. She'll be here in a few minutes. That's good. Goodbye, ma'am, and thank you. Goodbye, Mrs. Cashman. Goodbye. Find out who killed my husband. He never hurt anybody. Never. We'll do our best, ma'am. That's the rush back to headquarters, Simmons. One of my boys pulled in a suspect, Jason. Oh? Fella who worked for Cashman, a cleaning man named Moe Smith. What do they got on him? Well, he cleaned the office last night about 8.30 or 9 o'clock. Cashman usually closed before then on Saturday nights, but Smith admits Cashman was still there when he cleaned up. Well, he's not trying to hide anything there. No, no, but there's something else. Moe Smith was on the town last night, threw a big party and threw a lot of money around. Still had a few hundred on him when he was picked up. And uh, my man checked on that, Jace. Smith is usually dirt poor. I see. He's going to be worth talking to. You can say that again. I'd have told you inside the house, but I didn't want to say anything in front of Mrs. Cashman. That was best. How old is their baby? Mm, just two years old, Jace. Why? You look kind of funny. How old are the Cashmans? Well, I'd say Harry was about 55. Guess Mrs. Cashman must be in her 40s. Oh, I see what you mean. Uh, the baby's an adopted child. I thought they were a little bit old to have a child of that age. Yeah, they never had any of their own. A couple of years ago, they took in a poor girl who'd lost her husband. Anne was her child. Cashman's took to the kid right off. Then the mother got sick, and when she knew she was dying, she agreed to let the Cashmans adopt the baby. No kid ever got a better break, believe me. I gather they were pretty crazy about her. Plenty crazy. Why, if that kid even sneezed, Harry Cashman would be ready to charter a plane and fly at a Mayo Clinic. They wrapped their lives around her, just like she was their own. When you feel that way about a kid, it is your own. Loving them is what makes them belong to you. Yeah, you can say that again. Say, any messages from my headquarters in that phone call you took? Oh, Jace, I forgot. I, I was too hot about my man picking up Moe Smith. Your lab phoned in a report on that chalk. Any lead? Well, I, I don't know under the circumstances, but it wasn't an ordinary piece of chalk. Analysis showed that it's a special type that surveyors use for marking. Surveyors, huh? Yeah. Isn't likely that a janitor would be carrying the kind of chalk used by surveyors. Oh, it might have come from any place, Jace. A customer might have dropped it. It was dropped and stepped on after the office had been cleaned. Maybe our case against Moe Smith isn't going to be as strong as it looks. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Death by Adoption, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. At the city jail, Moe Smith was being held in an anteroom. The day was cool, but beads of sweat stood out on his forehead. If he was innocent, he didn't look at them. I began to forget about the surveyor's chalk. Come on, Moe's. Where were you last night? I was at a party, Mr. Simmons, at my own house. And where were you before the party? I was working for Mr. Harry Cashman at the used car lot. Everybody knows I worked there. What time did the party start, Mose? Uh, after 10 o'clock, sir. And later we left my house and went a few other places. Were you paying all the bills? Well, well, is that right or isn't it? That's right, sir. I don't remember much about it. Next thing I knew was this morning, and a policeman woke me up and brought me down here. What time was it when you left the car lot last night? Oh, I worked almost 9 o'clock, sir, cleaning up like I always do. Was Mr. Cashman all right when you left the lot? No, sir, he wasn't. 
Mr. Harry was always mighty nice to me, but somebody called him on the telephone. He didn't say much to whoever it was. Then he slammed the phone down real mad, and he hollered at me to hurry up and finish. He ain't never done that before, sir. Then when I got done and was ready to leave, he told me he's sorry he yelled at me like that. What'd you do then? I, I did some shopping for the party. Got some food, a couple of jugs of Sweet Lucy. Where'd you get the money? Spill it, Mose. Cashman was robbed, and you had almost $300 on you this morning when you were picked up. It was my own money, sir, honest. You never got that kind of money working on a used car lot. Three days ago, you were broke. You borrowed $2 from your landlady. You better count for that money, Mose. Where'd you get it? Oh, well, from the numbers. Numbers? You mean you've been gambling on the numbers racket? Yes, yeah, sir. And yesterday, my number hit, 424. I got my $500. That, that's how come I got money. You expect us to swallow that? And... Who paid you off, Mose? I don't know, sir. I don't know who he was. Are you trying to tell us you gambled on numbers without knowing who you gave your bets to? Please, sir. If I tell you who it is, Mr. Simmons is going to arrest him. And everybody will know I told. And if I don't find out, you're going to stand trial for murder. Everybody will know that, too. Oh, no, sir. Please. I never hurt Mr. Harry. Oh, I got the money from Jonas. One of the pen boys at the bowling alley. Jonas been booking numbers on the side? No, sir. He just worked for somebody for a little cut. All right, Mose. We'll check on your story. And it better be true. I told the truth every word. Well, he sounded on the level, Jace. And if he is, I'll be able to smash a hole in the numbers racket. Yeah, you can do that, all right. But we'll still be shy of murderer. Simmons staked out the bowling alley where Jonas worked as a pin setter. Moe Smith had told the truth, all right. The pin boy confirmed it when he was arrested for possession of slips made out by betters playing the numbers. We were back to a single clue again, the yellow chalk. We've checked the only surveying crew in the city, Chase. Every man working on it had an alibi. All surveyors aren't in the city. That killer could have come from any place in the county. No road building projects underway, and only other surveying crew we've been able to trace is the mapping crew down in the big bend. Not going to be easy to get to. I'll get to him. Wherever this car won't take me, the horse and the trailer I'm towing will. Huh? You leaving right away? As soon as I can drop you at your headquarters. I drove to the big bend to where the roads ran out, and I had to cut cross country to reach the mapping crew. I unloaded charcoal from the trailer. The crew was deep in wild country. Almost a full day's ride before I reached him. All right, Charky. Easy, boy, easy. Anybody here? Hello, over this way. Come on, Charky. Well, howdy, Ranger. Howdy. Saw marks of a camp here, but it looked deserted. Well, it is. We moved in another couple of miles. I just come back with the birds to haul the last of our stuff onto the new camp. I was just tying a pack on this last one. You the crew foreman? Yeah. I'll ride on away with you. Keep you from getting lonesome. Glad to have you. I got company, though. One of my men just went on ahead a few minutes ago. We'll catch up to him on the way. Hey, you want me to take one of those lead ropes? No, they're good birds. They won't give me no trouble. All right, let's go. Up, Chuck. Up, boy. Come on, you long-eared scavengers. You've had enough grazing. You must be covering a lot of ground in here. Oh, plenty. In a sprawling country like this, ranchers lose sight of their boundaries when the land ain't fenced off. Hey, you, uh, after somebody in here, Ranger? Maybe. How long you fellas been working through here? Oh, been almost two months now. You ever pull out to go into town? Well, we got horses, of course, but it's a long ride to a road and transportation any place of any size. <laughs> I just decided to grow me some whiskers and stay here till the job's done. Any of your men ride out? Oh, yeah. A few of them go out weekends to Central City or someplace like that for Saturday night. Then they got to turn around and spend all day Sunday coming back. Family men usually stay and just keep on working, pile up overtime. How many men you got working? Oh, I got 11. Any of them away last weekend? Yeah, four of them. You know where they went? No. Hey, I reckon Bill Stryker can tell you, though. Who's he? There's a fellow with the other burrows. Ah, there he is, just topping that rise about a quarter of a mile ahead. He one of the ones who left camp? Yeah, they all went off together. Let's catch up to him. Okay, come on, boy. Get a bird. Get up, Charcoal. We rode after the man named Bill Stryker. On the way, I saw the surveyor's marks I'd been following for miles. Cloth markers nailed to trees. 
yellow chalk marks on rocks. Within a few minutes, we caught up to him. Well, yeah, Ranger. We was away for the weekend, like Tracy told you. Me and three other fellas. Where'd you go? Central City. Only place worth going we could get to in time. What did you do up there? Well, just fool around. All of us together. Well, you were only there for Saturday night. You must have done something special, something you remember. I saw one of the boys mention the dance, Striker. Well, well, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Squad dance, Alamo Ballroom. You spend the whole evening there? Yeah. Like I said, we were all together. All evening. And four stags at a dance drift around. Hard to keep an eye on each other all evening. E- yeah, I reckon we could lose sight of each other for a minute or two. You fellas take time out to do any shopping? Well, what could we buy that we could bring back here? I thought maybe one of you might be saving some money, maybe enough to make a deal on a used car. Uh, we, we rode a bus both ways after our horses got us from here to Lannis Junction. Oh, that's too bad. If you'd been shopping around a used car lot, you might have been able to help me. You might have gotten a look at a man who killed a dealer named Cashman in Central City on Saturday night. Killed? Hey, Ranger, you got a reason for being here. Hey, you think one of my crew killed that man? I'll know better when we see the other three who went to town with Stryker here. Let's get on to the camp. It didn't help. They all told the same story. There were gaps times during the evening when they drifted away from each other, but they couldn't pin it down to any specific time on the clock. I didn't have anything to take them in on singly or together. They knew it, and I knew it. I camped with them overnight and headed back to Central City Police Headquarters. Oh, hi, Chase. How'd you make out? No good, Chief. Uh, we haven't turned up anything new either. Just a chance armed robbery, Chase. That's what it must have been. My feelings still bucket that, Simmons. Mose told us that Cashman was upset about a phone call. Stayed at the lot long after he should have gone home. There must have been a reason. Uh, like what? Like somebody who wanted to see him, telling him to wait there? Yeah. Moe said the call made Cashman mad. Why'd they wait for somebody he was mad at? Maybe because they had some kind of a club they could use to make him wait, whether he liked it or not. You're still digging for something deeper than an armed robbery motive, then. That's right. Well, nobody's given us anything to back up any other motive. I know, but a man doesn't make a telephone appointment to be robbed and murdered. He makes it for something else. I'm going out to see Mrs. Cashman again. When you called your husband last Saturday night, it was almost ten, you said. What makes you think he was upset? When you're married to a man for 15 years, you just know that's all. But he said there was nothing wrong. Anything like that ever happened before? His not coming home, I mean, acting upset? Yes, it did. Twice before. Once was almost two months ago, then a couple of weeks ago. Those other times. You remember what day they happened on? I mean, can you remember if it was always on a Saturday? Yes. Always, all three times. But I don't know why. I don't know what was bothering him. How'd he react? He was nervous, irritable. It surprised me the first time. Harry had never been that way with anybody. He snapped at me, the hired girl. Apologized later, but the only one he didn't snap at was the baby. He just seemed to want to hold her in his lap. Just sit there and rock back and forth, holding her. And then during the night, he kept getting up. Go into a crib to look at it. I see. Ma'am, did your husband ever say he was worried about somebody trying to take little Anne away from you? Why, no. Who could take her from us? Both her parents were dead. Her mother agreed to the adoption before she passed on. You ever know the baby's father? Ever see him? No, he died before Anne was born. Killed in an accident. You're sure of that? Well, that's what Anne's mother told her. She couldn't have lied. Have you got a copy of the baby's birth certificate? Yes, right in this drawer. With a copy of the adoption papers we got from the court. Here's the court order. And the paper signed by Anne's mother, Dorothy Stryker. Stryker? Was the father's name Bill or William Stryker? Why, no. Here it is on the birth certificate. His name was Arthur Stryker. Came from Fort Worth. Ranger, what is it? I think I know who killed your husband now. And I'm beginning to figure why. You'll hear from me, ma'am. I headed for the Big Bend, making a radio check with KTXA, asking the station to contact the Fort Worth police on possible relationship between Arthur and William Stryker. The answer fit. They'd been brothers. But William Stryker had a criminal record. It was late afternoon when I mounted charcoal for the ride into the surveying camp. 
I reached it at about 3 a.m., dismounted, and slipped into the office tent. Tracy. What the... Shh, quiet. It's me, Pearson. Boy, you scared me. Shh. Why'd you come back? Not all your boys were square dancing at Central City. Where's Stryker sleeping? Oh, Stryker, huh? That's right. I'm back, near where the horses are hobbled. We better be careful, Ranger. He's got a gun. Good. A test can give me the final proof I need if it's the same gun that killed Cashman. I'll come with you. If he wakes up before I get to him, you hit the ground and stay there, no matter what happens. Don't worry. I'm a surveyor, not a hero. There, under that tree. Branches in the moon got it all in shadow, though. He's not here. Well, somebody's trying to get away with one of the horses. Come on. Oh, he must have seen you out in the moonlight crossing to the tent. Get away from that horse, Striker. You're in the light now. I can see you, too. There's something you won't say. Oh, Ranger, you're hit. Drop. Got him. Be careful. Might be a trick. Are you other men? Stay down. Don't move. Oh, it's no trick, Ranger. Oh, he's hit more than once and bad. Uh, I don't want to die. Don't let me die. <laughs> Better get whatever first aid stuff you have. It. Try and patch him up. You're going to need some work, too. I'll be all right. You men can get up now. <clears throat> need a couple of you to make a letter. I need it to take him in. I... Hey, easy, Ranger. Oh. I got you. Oh, men will have to make two letters. You need one yourself. William Stryker lived long enough to confess his masquerade as the father of his dead brother's child and the murder of Harry Cashman. He was pronounced dead shortly after arrival at the nearest emergency hospital. Jace Pearson had three bullets removed from his body. They matched the bullet taken from the body of Harry Cashman. Six weeks later, Jace Pearson reported back to his company, ready again for duty with the Texas Rangers. Now, here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. There's a story about one of the first Texas Ranger captains whose outward appearances seemed to be little more than a boy. One of the Rangers in his command, a big, raw-boned, muscular fellow noted for his complete lack of fear, was asked by a townsman, how come a big fellow like you takes orders from him? Why, he ain't even got enough of a beard to need shaving. The Ranger looked at the townsman. Maybe he hasn't got much of a beard, the Ranger admitted. But when we go out after a gang of bandits with him outnumbering us three or four to one, I never yet heard the captain say, go get them, boys. He always says, come on, men, follow me. Good night, folks. See you again next week. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Joe Kearns, Tom McKee, Roy Glenn, and Barbara Luddy. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keats. Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Coming up next on NBC, it's genial accordion-playing master of ceremonies, Phil Baker, back at his old Sunday night stand asking America's favorite question. What's that? Why, the $64 question, of course. The chimes are your invitation every Sunday to all the fun and prizes and excitement of everybody's favorite quiz game, the $64 question. Tomorrow, hear the Railroad Hour. Right now, it's the $64 question on NBC.